Hello and welcome to Frost Over the World. Later in the programme, Henry Kissinger on China, Russia and the Middle East. Paddy Ashdown on Afghanistan and Serbia. And a debate between Israeli and Palestinian on Gaza. But first, the science of genetics. Last week, a team of scientists in California made a startling announcement. They had created the world's first completely synthetic genome. This brings them to the final stage of their audacious project. They are on the verge of creating artificial, man-made life. To many, that's what they call playing God. But today, I'm joined by Craig Venter, the man behind last week's breakthrough, the man who may have the future of life on Earth in his hands. Craig, for the benefit of our non-scientific viewers, that includes me, can you just explain to us what the human genome is? Well, the human genome is our complete collection of genetic material uh, that we've inherited from both of our parents. Uh, it's in the form of uh, chromosomes. We get 23 from each of our parents, uh, and the combination of those uh, and all the genetic letters uh, form uh, all of our basis of our uh, life uh, to start with. Uh, it's our complete genetic repertoire. And so what you've achieved is the second of your three great stages. You've created the world's first synthetic man-made genome. Well, the, uh, the, the synthetic uh, genome that we've made, is a, it's a long way from the human genome. Uh, so in the human genome, we have six billion letters. Uh, we're starting at a very tiny scale. It's the smallest uh, genome of every, any uh, living bacteria. It's on the order of uh, 570,000 uh, base pairs. So it's a, a tiny fraction of the human genome, but it, it is the largest molecule uh, thus far made uh, by humans. Uh, it's over 300 mil million molecular weight, and uh, it all started with four bottles of chemicals. Four bottles of chemicals. And so now you move on to the third stage, which I guess obviously is the big stage, of actually creating artificial life. That's right. That's, that's the big challenge ahead of us. How long will it take to get to stage three? And how long will it be before humanity is able to benefit from what you've discovered? Well, those are two uh, very different questions, but uh, right now we are doing experiments. We are trying to transplant the synthetic chromosome uh, into uh, some cells to see if it will uh, take over those cells. Uh, but these cells grow extremely slowly. They take about six weeks before you even see enough of them uh, to know that an experiment has worked at all. Uh, so it's very tedious work. Uh, but as I said, I hope that will happen sometime this year. I, I've said that I will be uh, surprised and disappointed uh, if the team's not able to achieve that. Uh, the second part in terms of how uh, this benefits us, uh, it changes things certainly at a conceptual level of how we understand life. Uh, clearly that the genetic code, whether the uh, chemical is made in the lab or is made naturally, uh, is clearly the instruction material for the life of these cells. Uh, we are using processes short of making entire cells right now to see if we can come up with new biological sources of fuel. Uh, we have some cells that we have modified uh, versus making from scratch uh, that produce uh, unique fuels. We have a second and possibly a third generation fuel uh, that we start with sugar right now, but uh, I, I think to us the biggest issue facing humanity is what we are doing to our environment. Uh, largely due to taking carbon in the form of oil and coal out of the ground and burning it and putting it in the atmosphere. So if we can contribute to finding a renewable source of energy uh, by constantly recapturing the CO2 uh, from the environment, making new fuels that can be recycled, uh, I think that could be a major benefit. Could you really remove the threat of carbon dioxide in particular and global warming? In general, could you do that? Well, it could certainly contribute to it. We've argued that we need hundreds to thousands of solutions. There won't be any one magic bullet that all of a sudden gets us weaned off of oil. 
Uh, we have huge industries uh, uh, that uh, took 10 years, for example, to build a coal power plant, uh, getting them uh, weaned off immediately, uh, even if there are new sources, w won't uh, happen as fast as we'd all like to have it happen. Uh, but it pushes us in the right direction, and uh, my hope is that in 10 to 20 years, uh, we might be able to uh, stop uh, using uh, non-recyclable uh, carbon. And what about those people who worry about the dangers of this technology? What if the technology that you are developing, hoping to improve the world, fell into the hands of bioterrorists? Well, the technology, and, and by the way, it is something we're very concerned with. We asked some of these ethical questions before we ever did our first experiment. Uh, I think it's one of the first times in history where the complete ethical and uh, practical review took place before we uh, undertook the first uh, steps in the lab. Uh, we've been talking about this work now for over a, a decade, trying to have a public discussion. Uh, the U.S. government has reviewed uh, some of this work at the highest levels. There's committees to deal with dual-use research now in the U.S. Th these are concerns uh, because uh, uh, up until recently, as you know, we've had uh, the U.S. government and the former Soviet Union funding biological warfare research. Uh, that now by treaty has stopped. So uh, uh, you and I don't have to go back too far in history uh, during our lives to know that people have tried to do uh, uh, create lethal events out of biology. Uh, so we always have to be concerned with that. Um, right now, this takes extremely sophisticated uh, teams uh, uh, to do this. It's very expensive to do, uh, and I don't think it would be the route of choice um, uh, for anybody wanting to do harm, fortunately. Um, at the same time, uh, it's going to be very difficult for somebody to try and make a pathogen. As we've discovered in our uh, sampling around the globe, uh, we have tens to hundreds of millions of bacteria, microorganisms, uh, ten times that many viruses. Uh, most of them could care less about us as a species. Uh, only a tiny percentage of them affect humans, and it's very difficult uh, for us to even understand the realm of how they do that. So we're working with organisms uh, that we know how to make sure they're not infective, uh, and we're trying to make sure they uh, can't grow outside of the laboratory, outside of a production facility. Uh, part of the engineering component allows us to engineer these intelligently, uh, so the fears that some people have will never be realized. All of this investigation, though, Craig, boiling down uh, the mystery of life to a very long genetic code, I mean, do you find that for you, the magic of life, it's the miracle of life, has been somehow lessened by your ability to measure it. Uh, in fact, David, quite the opposite. Uh, as we start to understand the uh, enormous complexity of life, uh, the fantastic molecular machinery that goes together in a, uh, it's trying to put a symphony orchestra of uh, uh, thousands and thousands of pieces together that have to work together in synchrony to have a living cell, even with the most simple cells. Uh, when we go to our own uh, bodies and our own genomes, we have a hundred trillion cells uh, in our bodies, all using this same uh, genetic code, uh, expanding to form tissues through stem cells. Uh, I think anybody that really looks into it will have far more uh, respect for the diversity of life, for the miracle uh, of life, if you want to use that term, uh, than people who just uh, view us as single entities uh, made by uh, a mystery component. Thank you very much, Craig. In a moment, what next for the Palestinians of Gaza? That's after this short break.